Thank you so much for your time. But as you all know, nowadays you can be in multiple places at the same time with these devices that we carry around. So I'd rather thank you for your attention, which these devices and technologies have taught us the difference, the distinction. And they taught us the value. In the same way that Facebook has taught us the value of true friendship and relationship. <laughs> But seriously, I'm the director of a lab that studies the effect that technology has on our state of mind. And then it goes further to attempt to devise new kinds of technology that honor our most precious resource, our attention, our state of mind. Now, I call the, the lab the calming technology lab, and that's because Calm is that state of mind that we often are after, where it's the absence of anxiety, the absence of reactivity. It's not necessarily relaxed. So a quarterback in the pocket needs to be calm in order to make the right play, but doesn't want to be relaxed. If you're doing an exam at school or giving a presentation or figuring out what you need to be doing at work for the next hour, there's energy there. But there's presence and there's a lack of hesitation. So we call that calm. One of the conclusions of the lab is that people that we call great performers, or even great people, you know, they're just like us. What's the difference? Is that they make a habit of cultivating great moments in their day. And these are really simple, accessible moments that we all have in daily life. And they make it a habit. And it's an intention to make those moments of greatness occur for them. These can be moments of letting someone go in front of you in line somewhere, in traffic, just to ensure that you have a, a nice drive. Or before you start work, asking yourself, what's the most important thing I need to be working on? How do I need to go about doing that? It's all these moments that create clarity and calm in our mind that help us be our most effective, our most genuine, our most communicative. So four years ago, I was on a bus with the woman I love, who's here in the audience today, and is now the mother of our 16-month-old daughter. We were on this bus in rural Laos, winding through the mountains. And I was in such a place of calm and clarity and peace on that bus ride with her, even though it was making me kind of sick <laughs> going through these mountains. I took that state of mind and I directed my attention to my work and asked myself, what should I be focusing my energy on if I had to choose one thing? And the answer came to be, use my skills in product design and technology research and creation and apply them to helping cultivate this state of mind that is the root of so many different behaviors in our daily life. How we talk, how we choose to eat, what, how we choose to take care of ourselves, all these things, there's a root there. And I decided that the most tangible, objective, measurable, scientifically validated way I could do that was to change the way the world breathes. This, I didn't really mean to change the way the world breathes. I meant to change the role that the breath has in the world and unlock it from this thing that many of us know is so powerful, but it kind of stays as a secret, and bring it out in the same way that we talk about calories and steps and these very tangible things that are very real. Now, I knew from my personal experience that the breath was, ha had this power. I had meditated, I had done yoga, you know, I had experimented with things. But when I came back to Stanford, I studied the science behind the breath, what's called respiratory psychophysiology. And if you've ever meditated or you've ever spent a few minutes just kind of watching your breath, it's kind of just intrinsically fascinating. The science is really fun, and so I decided, I'm gonna just, this is what I'm gonna do from now on. I'm just gonna go all in on this. 
and it is amazing. The ancient Greeks used the word pneuma to mean breath, but they used the same word for the soul. And it's just not ancient Greece. There are so many cultures where these concepts are the same word, linked. The Hawaiians, you know, they use the word aloha to mean hello. Aloha actually means to share breath with somebody else. That's how core it is in the culture. If you've been to Hawaii, you've probably heard the word haole, which is the word used for mainlanders who came over. Haole actually means one without breath. <laughs> and it's not just these cultures, it's in our daily life. Hey, take a deep breath. Are you holding your breath? Breathe easy. And it goes on, culture after culture, civilization after civilization. Modern science has taught us even more. It showed us that the breath cycle is not just air going in, air going out. It's a microcosm of our entire nervous system. The inhale energizes the body. It prepares us for action. The exhale complements that, calming the body, allowing the rest and digest system to take, take effect. And that cycle, in and out, is happening thousands of times per day. And if you look at it over time, you can see very interesting things about what that person is going through in their mind. One of the things that happens is that when we're tense, we often clench these muscles, these muscles. What are we doing? We're, in effect, cutting off oxygen to our brain. Now, if you look in the brain, you find the medulla and the amygdala, these are the centers of the brain that drive how we think and how we feel. They are also acting as exquisitely sensitive carbon dioxide sensors. So these parts of the brain that drive how we think and how we feel, they're intrinsically tied to how we breathe, and they influence how we breathe. So that clenching that's happening, it's, ha it's having these parts of your brain send signals that are like, I'm subtly suffocating. I'm subtly not getting in the air I need. There's something wrong. And then we wonder why at the end of the day we feel out of breath. We feel like we can't think clearly and the same way that we feel in nature or when we're calm. So it's clear that there's incredible benefit available to more fluency and expertise with our breath. The question was like, what do we do with that? So we went back to our lab and we started to hack and prototype and figure out ways. We, we started putting sensors around the abdomen, strapping things on and figuring out how to unlock that precious signal and send it to places where it would be useful. So we sent it to the computer screen. We sent it to your laptop screen and we did experiments there having very interesting effects about work, breath, and state of mind. But then we went a step further and we sent it to the phone, which is a very intimate relationship with a person. It's close to the body, we use it often, and it's, a, it's an interesting place to be aware of your state of mind. But when we went out into the world, we realized, duh, people aren't going to be willing to strap things on their abdomen and wear these tight things on a day-to-day -day basis. So we spent a good amount more time to figure out how we could sense the breath in a way that was practical in real life, in daily life. And so we came up with this. This is spire. It's like a magical little stone. And just like other activity trackers, it's like a, it acts as a pedometer, it tracks exercise, it tracks how you walk, but it's also looking at that expansion and contraction of your torso as you breathe in, breathe out. And it's incredibly sensitive. And it looks at that rhythm, and it looks at that pattern, which is actually the rhythm of your own mind as it fluctuates throughout the day. And it's aggregating and it's uncovering these insights about how you think, about how you feel. But, though this, this is, technology can act as a tool, the breath is belonging to everybody. It's available all the time. So let's take a minute to experience the shift that's available for us. I ask that you just relax and put your hands in your lap. Put down any instruments or phones. Or... This is gonna be short but impactful. And just close your eyes. 
And I want you to observe your breath like a scientist, like an artist, like an observer. Don't try to change it. Just observe it for what it is. Like you would watch the flame of a candle or a campfire. You know, you could just watch it endlessly. It's so fascinating. Every breath is unique. And the more you're close to it, the more you realize the relationship it has with your mind. And the timings of when the inhale emerges and how long it stays is not random. There's an elegant and beautiful and enlightening relationship with our state of mind. Now, what I want you to do is emphasize in your mind, see the exhale as the beginning of the, breath, of the breath cycle instead of the inhale. Just see the exhale as the beginning. Don't change it. Just realize that that's just a perspective. The exhale can be the beginning and the inhale can be the afterthought. And what you're doing by doing that is you're emphasizing in your mind the parasympathetic component to your breath cycle. The part of your breath that is calming, that is clarifying. The micro pause after your exhale is the calmest part of your experience of life. And it happens all the time. And it's something you can experiment with and in, enjoy like you enjoy a campfire or a flame. Go ahead and open your eyes. You know, modern science has taught us so much and we talk so much about our physical bodies and how to lose weight and exercise and do all these things and, and that's incredibly important. And we talk a lot about the importance of our state of mind. What we're attempting to do and what I hope that we've, we've communicated is a tangible, scientifically validated means of becoming aware and in control of and in influence of our most precious resource, our attention and the state of our own mind to help us not only be ourselves but to give ourselves a chance to be great. Thank you so much.